Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Seven miles from the Chattahoochee River, a couple of miles from Norcross in Gwinnett County in Georgia. The area used to be much more residential and underdeveloped than it is now. The Chattahoochee River was about seven miles away. I assume that this creature had made its way from that direction. I had consequently learned that the area has had several incidents of sightings over the years previous to mine. The events that led up to my sighting occurred over a four-month period in the spring. Since then, I have always wished that I could get up close to the creatures. The incident started one day in a swampy area. My friends and I were building a fort with bamboo stalks when we noticed that the animal sounds in the woods had disappeared. It was deathly quiet. Then we heard a large branch snap. We got scared as the sound had come from only 50 to 75 feet behind us in the swampy part of the bottom. We imagined a psychopath with a large knife and proceeded to quietly leave the area in single file. That is when we heard the animal scream and run towards us by the sound of the stomps in the leaves. Afterwards, we discussed what could possibly have made such noises. A monster? What? We did not know. But somewhere in the conversation, the possibility of a Bigfoot came up. And that seemed more plausible to our 14-year-old mind. In the subsequent weeks, we found tracks, five-toed and three-toed, but never a trail of them. We would hear far-off animal sounds and such. We even found an area of pushed-down grass a few days later, in the spot we figured the screams had come from. We had mounted an expedition to look for the creature a few days after the initial incident, and had left our shoe print in the mud and sand. A couple of days after that, a few of us went back, and we discovered something very peculiar. In addition to three toed tracks, we found a series of tracks that looked like the bare feet of children, following our trail of footprints. I am convinced to this day that the creature that had screamed at us was probably a female with babies, this was the only time we found a trail of tracks. Another time we had found, further back in the woods, a large footprint shape with no discernible features such as toes on the side of a small creek. On the other side, we found another in the mud, which appeared to be the opposite foot. These two footprints were several feet away from each other, a big step. My friend Mike and I would walk up to the bus stop in the early morning hours as the dawn began to eventually brighten the sky. He came to my house one morning with an excitement in his voice as he told me that he had seen the shadow of the creature across his backyard as he got dressed. He lived just two doors over and there was a section of the wood that ran up behind the houses. He told me that he heard our neighbor's dog barking wildly and could hear the creature running through the woods behind the houses. I wasn't sure if he could be believed, but I was too excited by the prospect to be skeptical. As we walked up to the bus stop, we proceeded to look back down the street our cul-de-sac turned off of as it dead-ended at a petroleum pipeline field with the swamp on the other side. There was also some woods on the left side of the street with a strip of cleared ground between the edge of the wood and the street. There was one street lamp on a telephone pole down there near the edge of the road on the left side, and it was under this lamp that we noticed a large cone-shaped dark area. We knew that there had been no mound of dirt or sticks there before, just level ground. As we watched, the mound decide to stand up and walk toward the end of the street. However, it turned left, picked something off the ground, 
and ducked into the strip of woods there. As we were about 300 feet from the creature, it appeared dark gray like a shadow. I grabbed Mike's sleeve and said, we gotta get closer. Of course, he didn't want to. The creature was estimated to be seven feet tall and quite skinny. It had wide hips and its arms were almost to its knees. It also had what appeared to be a sagittal crest at the top of the head. I don't know what color it was, but I would guess from what I subsequently learned about previous sightings in the area and from Grover Krantz's book that it must have been white. It would make sense, would it not, that Krantz's rogue males group might very well include any albinos or others with different traits from the majority of Sasquatch apes that may very well be shunned into a life of wandering the rest of the North American continent. On one morning, I believe it may have been that fall, we were walking, Mike and I, to the bus stop, heard a far-off two-tone call from the swamp. I answered back, and in a few seconds, we heard it again, but this time it seemed to be closer, not so far off, I called again, and immediately we heard a return call, again much closer, as if the creature were moving through the swamp towards us. I called again, and this time it sounded as if it were at the edge of the swamp. Then my stepfather yelled at us out of his bedroom window, which was in front of the house second floor. They often had their windows open in fair weather. All right, all right, I yelled and a few moments later we heard the call again, this time coming from far, far away, as the first call had been. It was a two-toned call, a high-pitched note that turned into a low-pitched note. It was definitely a call of some sort. One morning it was still dark. We walked up to the bus stop, looking back at the swamp. We saw an orange flash of diffused light spreading up and out over the sky above the swamp. The duration was two seconds. Flash lightning, swamp gas. The initial incident occurred in March and continued on for four months or so. The sightings took place in the morning while it was still dark. The calls were heard in the morning, but it was light outside when we went to the bus stop a few months later. It was pine forest, creek bottom, somewhat sandy and muddy, very thick underbrush and swamp-like. There were many large creeks in the area, a sewage treatment plant, and heavily forested area to the north and east of the swamp, which was probably only a half mile square. We also found evidence in the swamp of its previous history, upright ties 15 feet high from the ground, part of an old wall. There were three of them, about 10 to 15 feet apart in a row. Further back, we found an old rotting outhouse. Then, further back still, we found a skinny mound of earth that went straight for several hundred feet. Off this, we found some pea plants. The creek in the swamp near where we first encountered the creature's scream seemed to have been man-made, like a small irrigation ditch. It was about three feet wide, had vertical sides and a flat bottom, altogether a very strange place. On to the next one. Douglasville in Douglas County in Georgia. Exit at Chapel Hill off Timber Ridge Road. I was 18 years old at the time and riding cross-country endurance for a local ranch. I had been riding for the ranch for four years when this event occurred. I had been out training a black Arabian stud that day, riding about 20 miles in the woods. It was getting dark, but the moon was full. I was riding on a wide dirt road with the woods on either side. Just after crossing a wood bridge, I was going around an S-curve in the road when the horse started acting up. I then heard a rustling sound in the woods next to me. Next came a loud scream from the same area. I looked and I saw a pair of eyes. They were greenish in color. What happened next went by very quickly. Whatever it was jumped out from the woods next to me and grabbed the saddle and back of the horse. As this happened, I jumped off the saddle onto the horse's neck, let go of the reins, and put my arms around the horse's neck. 
the horse bolted and ran. I didn't slow down or look back. This thing was face to face with me. I remember the face and the hand most of all. It had a hand, not a paw. The hands were huge with hair on them and long nails. The saddle, an endurance saddle, very lightweight without a horn, leather was torn and had deep scratches or gouges in it where the creature had grabbed it and pulled at it. It had very human-like features, but thicker and scary looking. The hair around its face and neck was very hairy and wiry looking blackish brown with piercing eyes, and it had teeth, but missing some and all were yellow. This thing was massive, standing upright but a little crouched. I was on a horse that is sixteen and a half hands high and was looking it almost straight in the face. This was not a cougar or a bear. The next morning, I returned to the ranch to look at the saddle and the horse. When I arrived and asked about the saddle, the owner said it was gone and the horse had been studded out. He also told me he didn't want me riding for him any longer. It was dusk with clear conditions and a full moon. On to the next one. Near Lafayette in Walker County, the area has changed a great deal since this incident happened. It was near Chamberlain, possibly Chamberlain Road. I was deer hunting on Pigeon Mountain and was following a group of deer when I shot and wounded an almost solid black buck with a large rack. The buck followed a well-worn game trail and I had trailed the deer by blood drops. It was getting dark and the terrain was getting too difficult to continue, and I had no light. I had to turn and come down the mountain. I began to feel like I was not alone. There were none of the normal animal sounds. Bird, squirrel, I heard something coming down the mountain, taking a parallel path I was taking. I could not see anything. There were limbs breaking, leaves rustling, and then I would hear nothing. I had unloaded my gun for safety, and reloaded because I had never heard an animal move through the woods like this one. Myself, one other person, and the owner were the only people allowed to hunt the area, and the terrain it was using was too rough for a human to travel, much less move at the speed this animal was. One minute it would sound like a raging bull, and the next minute it would move down the mountain not making a sound. I heard a grunt and a growl. I was terrified and felt as I was being stalked by something I had never encountered before. When I stopped, so did it. When I moved slow, it moved slow. When I moved faster, it moved faster. I was most worried when I would hear nothing. I reached the base of the mountain and had taken a wrong turn and had put myself in front of a large briar patch. I did not let that stop me. I drove through the briars cutting and scratching myself. I finally reached the safety of my truck and once again heard the grunting noise from behind me. I did not return to look for the buck. I had shot or ever hunt in the area again. I did not ever see anything, but something large was in the woods that night. I have not felt safe in the woods since. I had hunted, fished, and farmed in the area all my life. I felt as though I knew all the animals in the woods and the sound they made as they moved. I was taught to stock hunt by an employee who worked on our farm, and he lived in the Smoky Mountains and fed his family by hunting game. I had heard deer grunt before, and this was no deer grunt. There was no other animal sounds at the time. There had been stories of a creature who walked on two legs during that time period. There was an old dump on Shinbone Ridge where people would dump house garbage rotten food, and even dead animals. There were reported sightings there. One farmer claimed to have chased such an animal in his pickup in his field and could not catch it. It was running, he said, at 40 miles per hour. There was report of large hogs being carried over tall fences with blood everywhere, missing dogs, missing livestock, and strange noises. One farmer told me of seeing a creature chasing his cows saying it was black, had hair all over its body, moved on two legs, but moved like a cat. He told me this story 
while we were repairing fences in the area where he saw the animals. There was a rumor that an animal attacked a woman in a small car and nearly turned it over. The story I heard, she claimed it was a deformed bear. Some people guessed the animal was a bear burned and scarred in a fire or a genetically deformed bear that people were seeing. My friends and I were camping and fishing on a lake at the foot of Pigeon and one of my friend's brother showed up at 2 a.m. and told us he heard animals screaming behind his house not far from the lake. He made us go back to his house. None of us heard anything. In a remote part of Pigeon, a friend shot a deer. He dressed and hung it in a tree so it would not be gotten by a fox or coyote. He returned next day on his four-wheeler to find the deer and all clean and gone without a trace. I ran up and down the ridges to stay in shape during that time period, but I never saw the creature or any track. I heard noises I could not explain, but that's been years ago. During that time period, there were reported sightings of a black panther in the area. I asked the game warden and he told me that was impossible. But he also said, if I see one, it's against the law to kill it. It was dusk, dark, when it began, and pitch dark at the end. There was no moonlight, and it was cloudy and a cold night. Pigeon is rough, deep terrain, with a large network of caves. There are many ridges which have old mines and logging trails. On to the next one. On Little Tybee Island in Chatham County in Georgia, Little Tybee Island lies across Tybee Black River and slightly southwest. It is an uninhabited and wild barrier island. It has never been a habitat for man. People visit it and usually only in summer. I think it was on the 2nd or 3rd of January. I was on active duty and stationed at Hunter Army Airfield. One of my army buddies and our wives went out to Little Tybee Island on a camping and hunting trip. We had a nicely sheltered tent in land about 200 yards off the beach behind the dunes. The first night out was cold. It got into the high teens. The local forecast predicted record lows the next day and night. Our wives were cold and wanted to go in. We transported them back to Tybee and we went back out for an afternoon hunt. By 1600 hours, it was too cold to stay out. Our lab was coming out of the water with ice coating her. We returned to camp and had a warm fire going and ate an early supper and retired early. It was too cold to sit up. At approximately 2200 hours, I awoke to our lab growling softly. Jim was awake too. He asked me, Robbie, is your gun loaded? I assured him it was. We then heard a two-legged creature walking toward our tent from the rear. I say two-legged because men walk differently from deer. At that time, there were no deer or hogs on Little Tybee, although now there are. The creature stopped approximately 30 to 40 feet from our tent. Our tent was in a small valley and wouldn't be visible to someone coming from the back side of the island until they were upon it. There was a minute or two of complete silence. Even my lab was extremely quiet. She acted scared for the first time I had ever seen. There was then a whooshing sound of something large whirling through the air. It struck our tent with a tremendous whump. The dog went nuts. We both left the tent with our sixth vault headlight on and our shotguns at port arms. I caught a glimpse of something very dark colored and man sized running toward the back side of the island. I noticed an odor that I can only describe as a cross between gray fox and civet cat in the air. We ran after it out to the edge of the open marsh. It clearly could run faster without light than we could with the light. I never got close enough for a positive visual. There is nothing on the back side of Little Tybee except miles of open salt marsh, tidal rivers and creeks, and dozens of smaller hammocks and small islands. No man could or would have exposed himself to that marsh in those temperatures. The marsh itself was frozen hard, but the creeks weren't. Under those conditions, a man would perish in minutes if he got wet in salt water. We checked the only other boat landing on the island. 
the creek entrance on the northeastern end of the island. There was no boat or evidence of one being there. We walked the entire beach looking for prints or other boats, and we were the only boat on the beach. We discussed the incident a while and concluded that we may have had a Sasquatch encounter. At the time, I felt this was unlikely, as all the encounters I had ever heard was in the Pacific Northwest. Over the years, since I've come to realize that the Bigfoot enigma is worldwide in all wild places, it was 2200 hours, dark with no moon, and calm, an extremely cold night for southern Georgia. The temperatures went to negative six that night, a state record low. The following year, we returned on another duck hunt. I had my same lab, and my buddy had one of her nine-month-old pups. We were giving the pup working knowledge, using her mom. The weather was 40-ish, wet, miserable, and windy. Great duck shooting weather. We were taking a lunch-sleep break during the hard rain. The dogs were left outside to wander the island. We were awakened by the two dogs barking ferociously. The barking ended with a sharp whine. Soon, the older lab was at the tent, begging to be let in. She was trembling in fear. Her pup appeared a minute or two behind her. We passed it off as them barking at a passing boat. An hour later, we were awoken by the pup. She was in a grand mall seizure. She died soon after that. Both my buddy and I are skilled and experienced army medics. We had two tours in Vietnam. He is a PA. We carefully examined the dead pup for snake bite, gunshot wounds, or any other visible causes of trauma. We found nothing. We buried the pup on the island. I have never returned to Little Tybee since then. There is something there that the dogs feared, enough to kill one. The area is live oak, stunted by weather, but many over 300 years old. Bay shrubs, etc. There was ocean frontage to the eastern side, the north and south ends were blocked by tidal rivers. The backside was tidal marsh to the mainland. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, Thank you so much, and until next time, bye!